I'm the chairman of the advisory committee for the Department of Labor. Got a long ACES video or something that is for veterans education training and employer outreach. So that's one of the reasons I'm in Washington on the issue of how do we hire people. I'll give you a quick business background. Graduated from West Point, went immediately to Stanford Business School, um, where I taught surfing and scuba. <laughs> From that, having been qualified, I went to Vietnam with the 101st Airborne Division, uh, where I was given a company um, that you all would appreciate, and it has to do with what I want to talk about. Um, in the 1967 period, besides having the 101st Airborne marching in the streets of Detroit with live ammunition, handling our experiment of democracy, which, as an aside, I think we're a bit impatient with Iraq and all the other places, since we're still working on ours. We don't know why they don't get it right in six weeks. Think about what we were doing in 1987 in Detroit. They decided to expand the size of every infantry battalion in the United States Army. From a headquarters company to three rifle companies, they were going to a headquarters company and four rifle companies. They did the entire United States Army. The last division they were going to do was 101st. The last brigade within the 101st, and therefore the last brigade in the Army, was the third brigade. The last battalion in the United States Army, and therefore the last battalion in the 101st, was the 3rd Battalion, which happened to be the 3rd Battalion of the 187, the Rocket Science. The last company that would have been formed was Delta Company, 3rd of the 187, my company. Now think about it. You've got a certain number of people. It's at a time when you draft people, not to shoot on them, and march at the same time, either or, and some flunk that test. Where do you think they go? They go to Delta Company, because no one else wants it. <laughs> it was a time when Westmoreland said, I need 900,000, or whatever we're going to, empty the stockades. Where did they go? Delta Company. And then they ran bulletins that said, anybody unfit for the service to be accepted without question to Delta Company. <laughs> now, how did I get to be company commander? I reported in the 101st to the 3rd Brigade, and I come from Stanford where I didn't have a uniform. I, I had to go to an event and teach, so I bought a Marine Corps uniform. Because I happened to think the Marine Corps tropical worsted blouse with the pleats and all was really sharp. I didn't, I didn't buy a hat because, hell, I had a convertible, I'd lose it. So I just buy a shirt and tried the old anchor, drove the needle off, buffed it up. That was my uniform when I was at Stanford. So I reported in the 101st, I see the brigade commander, and I walk in. I'm supposed to be there at 7 in the morning. He makes me wait till 8. He looked, sticks his head out of the dress, get in here. Sure. Lieutenant Buick, I was the first lieutenant there, right? having never been a second lieutenant. <laughs> he said, I know who you are, I just don't know what you are. Get the hell out of here and go stand by that bush. <laughs> that building still exists and the bush still exists. I stood there until 8 o'clock at night, except for potty breaks, wearing low quarter shoes at the 101st Airborne, spray starch fatigues with that. Endlessly famous or infamous mistake of having someone in rank on the wrong collar. And I stood outside the third brigade headquarters as everybody walked in, because I was an officer, the NCOs and everybody besides laughing, saluted. And when I got in there, I was living with myself. And Colonel Maurer, I'll never forget it, he says, first of all, I read you 214, you went to Stanford Business School, you got an MBA. I bet you think that's a big damn deal. <laughs> Yes, sir. He said, well, you're going to meet a guy in this brigade that's got three master's degrees. So he won't be impressed. I said, sir, let me meet him and we'll see what goes. He said, you just met him and I'm not impressed. <laughs> so he, he then said, you're going to learn to be a captain. You're going to be a captain soon. I mean, he was coming very quick. <laughs> Having never been a first lieutenant, never been a, I mean, a second lieutenant, never really been a first lieutenant. He said, you're going to have every job in the company that we're forming because you're the only one in it. When I say pass and review, you're going to march holding a guide. You're going to be given the commands. You say eyes left or right, that's what you do. <laughs> when you're forming up, taking the uh, formation in the morning, you do the squad leader, platoon leader, platoon leader to the first sergeant, first sergeant to company commander report. You open up your pinpoint, you open up your supply room, you open up your armory. You file your daily morning reports. You are going to be a one-man show for 90 days. If you pass that, you're getting people. And the first eight people had drunk basic infantry training. And one of the guys, I'll never forget, came in and he said, I said, what do you do? 
He said, I'll make cars go fast. I said, no, what do you do in the Army? He said, I'll make cars go fast. <laughs> he said, where are you from? He said, Ducktown, Tennessee. I said, what do you do there? He said, make cars go fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the one guy in the company, and I got a motor pool. So I said, you're going to be Sergeant Lacker. Staple U5 stripes on the sleeve. He won the U5, presto. He drives in the motor school. <coughs> Went down the motor pool, he had dismantled all of them. Tearing them, he's covered with muck and dust. I said, what are you doing? He said, take the damn governors off these jeeps, sir. And I said, well, how, what are the governors? He says, they keep these things down under 45 miles an hour. Hell, they can go 70. And he took them off. We had the fastest jeeps in the 101st. <laughs> Most importantly, we never had one vehicle red on the entire time. This guy kept them running all the time. Now, if you think about it, next guy's coming in, 80 of them from stockades, some 14 years in the Army, E1, what'd you do? Try to kill the damn sergeant, sir. Right? Another guy says, why are you asking? One <laughs> 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 your company commander says, yeah, and if I don't answer you and don't call you, sir, you send me to stockade, and I don't have to go to Vietnam with you. I said, well, what's wrong? He says, you've been teaching serving and scuba. Everybody knows about you. And every other company commander has been to Vietnam at least once. So from those guys' point of view, when the stockade's not, I was the loser. I've been to West Point, whoop de damn dude. I went to Stanford Business School in the summer, went to Airborne and Ranger training. But I'd never really been in the Army. And they all knew I was the guy that showed up at the 3rd Brigade low quarters rank on the wrong column. So they looked at coming to Delta Company as a real insult. The next group of people came in and had master's degrees in things like Elizabethan literature. And their E6 is supposed to be a platoon sergeant. And I would say, what, are you, what have you been doing? Well, I've been a speechwriter since I got drafted. And they promoted me because I write for the general. All eight of them. Never fired a weapon, never did anything, just wrote speeches. They're now my future. And then the last group of guys were the ones that did 80 volt and said, anybody not wanted in any other company will be accepted by me. Found my first sergeant being court martialed. They were going to put him in a brigade for beating up the current division sergeant major. <laughs> we took him to the field. I learned when I was at West Point, if they don't trust you in the Army, it's simple. As long as you run further faster than anyone else and do push-ups when you get there, they think you're really smart. <laughs> so that's what we did. This was a group branded as the losers of losers. We had armor reporter, one of the few that ever came near us, labeled us the clerks and jerks of the 101st Airborne. He wrote that article after a battle we had that was the beginning of their reputation, not the end, the beginning. We'd been in Vietnam, and because of who we were, we were never allowed in base camp. Monkey meat, by the way, was Bob Hope's call sign. And when I heard monkey meat over the radio, I said, hey, we're going out, we're leaving, because we were never allowed to be in base camp over there. Most of the time, we weren't allowed to base camp anyway. So we were always in combat. For five months, we had no injuries. A few wounded, nothing serious. Well, everybody else was suffering casualties of the 30%. So we believed in ourselves. No one else did. They didn't want us around. That night, of the 89 guys there, 11 were killed, 64 were wounded, and everybody was decorated. They went on, long after I left, continued to do the same thing. They became the highest decorated unit of company size in the Vietnam conflict. And why is the story? Society had missed up the judgment. They had judged them losers. From that small example, proves that society knows very little about how to judge people they do not know. And in what you're trying to be and considering to be, that's one of the biggest lessons that you're going to have to learn and the obstacles to overcome. That who you find who work for you, others might say are losers. They're no good. They'll do you the rest and have to have you gone to college. I was with Smith Barney the other day and Morgan Stanley and they were was talking about recruiting vets, and the guy said to me, what, what about a vet that's never been to college? I said, what are you talking about? Cold call, call a person, hi. He says, what's your name? Wow, my name is Susie Q. Where'd you go to college? Well, I didn't go to college. Click. <laughs> I 
said, that's not the way it works. That's not, and he's the head of HR for both firms. I said, you don't have the call right. Call me. Let me be the vet. It's okay. Ring, ring. Hello? Who is it? Paul Buchan. Where'd you go to college? Sir, I haven't been to college yet. I've been the last eight years in Afghanistan, Iraq, serving you. I have the GI Bill. I can go anytime I want. I'm interested in learning about business and going to night school. How's that call go then? Wow. Tell me about it. Never thought I'd have a cold call from an Iraq, Afghanistan vet who's putting off college to go into business. And oftentimes that results in, hey, I'll give you a couple thousand. Do it again, do it again, do it again. And the guy says to me, that's not fair. And I said, well, that's the truth. You just don't like it. So that's the people you can hire and help. And I'll tell you a little about my business background. After, um, after West Point, my, and I'll just tell you why I left the service, because that's a good question. Um, I was teaching at West Point. My dad came to see me. I goofed around about going to law school in the Army and things like that. I an Army in the business school. And uh, he said, can I talk to you? Yeah. God, he'd been there a week. I thought he tell me how great it was. He said, I had a simple question. What the hell do you do? <laughs> I teach. He says, no, but what are you? I'm a captain of infantry, airborne ranger, jump master, the whole nine parts. He said, oh, yeah? I've been here a week. You haven't mentioned troops once. No captain of infantry, no colonel of infantry, no general of infantry, airborne ranger, it doesn't matter goes one day without thinking about troops. You've been talking about how to solve unemployment in Chicago. You've been telling me how to bring peace in Vietnam. But you haven't mentioned that which distinguishes you from everyone else, the privilege of leading soldiers. He said, I want you to get the hell out of my army. And let a better man take your place. 20 years he said, I worked to get rid of bums like you. Boom. You walk out the door. Boom. I went upstairs and cried my heart out. Not because of what he said, but because he was right. From that moment on, I decided I can't be one. I'm not good enough. I'm going to resign. Probably go to law school. But I'm going to work and service the better the rest of my life, and however I can do it. As I tell the soldiers, I'm not good enough to be one of you, but if I work hard, I can be among you. And I tell you that because don't forget our roots. Don't forget what we once were and what those who stay still are. <clears throat> Look upon that with great pride and humility, because that's very important in what you're trying to be. Okay? I left, was going to Harvard Law School, I met Ross Perot. He was buying up the brokerage industry, so I became Ross Perot's guy in New York, which meant I had an office that so helped me God it was a janitor's closet. <laughs> but because I reported directly to him, I had a line of VIPs outside all morning. I did that for three years. We merged DuPont with Oregon, which was the DuPont family thing called Sir Francis I. DuPont. With Walston, we became the second largest warehouse, which is selling retail. Bottom, after Merrill Lynch at the time. Then I had the misfortune being snowbound in Boston, and he asked me how it was going. I said, Bill, don't you talk to anybody? So I talked to everybody. I said, the chairman, I talked to the chairman. I said, the president, CEO, yes, talk to them today, too. And I said, you asking me how it's going, sir? He said, yeah. I said, well, you're going to lose $87 million twice over because we're going back. And you, and you knows Ross Bureau, he doesn't blink. But when he's really pissed, he never blinks and doesn't breathe. <laughs> so I told him that. And he said, well, I said, no, I mean, I, I hate to tell you, I'm the guy I talk to all the time, but I would think someone else more responsible would have told you. And so we ended up going, he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to law school. This is the dumbest job I've ever done in my life. I spent 500 bucks every time I'm checking to find out why an executive spent 250. It doesn't make any sense. 
You keep people around because they are veterans, but they can't produce stock sales. So it's not meritocracy, it's a bureaucracy staffed by people who once were something. And we don't train them. I said, go to law school. He says, is there anything else you do? And this was the mistake of my life. I listened to that. I said, yeah, I'd like to take EDS to Iran. So we formed EDS World, which I was the president, or senior vice president of, in charge of all international operations, of which there were none, and all the employees, of which there was one. And I sold the contract in data processing. Actually, it was microfiching the Navy's records of Iran. 12 men, $12 million for one year. Six million paid in advance. And that started my business. I moved to Iran. Seven years later, I left Ross. And we had 18 countries, almost 4,500 employees. And we controlled the countries we were in. And in Iran, we did Minister of Finance, Minister of Oil, the Bank of Iran, the Shah's Bank, the Shah of News Office, and the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. We collected taxes. We exempted those who couldn't have to pay. We distributed the mullahs their money. Prime Minister said, don't give it to them. We were the ones that stopped paying. That's what these guys, and who were they? They were all rats with their families. Every one of them was a veteran with their family because they could live in that environment. The guys in Kuwait were the same way, in Saudi Arabia the same way, the people in Turkey the same way. All of them were the same. They were veterans, interested in entrepreneurial experience with the little bit of safety that a corporation would make the payroll. Why? It's something for you all to consider. Overseas, there's fortunes to be made. A lot of excitement and lots of things to learn that will make you a better person going on. After that, <clears throat> I left because I said, hell, I'm doing this for Ross, look what I did. I can do this for myself. I became an entrepreneur. When I called the same minister I spoke to the week before, he was too busy to take the call. When I called the head of the bank the week before, he took the call, but this next week he wouldn't. I had learned a big lesson that if you represent someone rich and powerful and strong, they take your call. If you represent yourself, they're too busy. It was a rude way, but it had been so easy. I was living in Paris. I said, I can do this for all the French people. And I was working for the biggest data processing firm. But I was working for myself, representing them. And I realized then that as an entrepreneur, don't confuse yourself with someone else who might be a more successful entrepreneur. After that, I kept doing that. One of my clients happened to be a man named Francois Sperry and his partner, Franz Bismarck of Germany. First Ferdinand from Bismarck, so he was actually the real thing. And they hired me to find them a site to develop on the water in the United States. I looked all over Los Angeles, all over Seattle, and I found the site, believe it or not, right by the Statue of Liberty in Jersey City, called Cave Port Military Reservation. And we built a thing called Port that made me a real estate developer. The only reason I became that, I became a condition of default if I left, because the banks didn't want to chase him to France and prison back to Germany. So I became a real estate developer. When the real estate market crashed, I was sitting on a board called WHX, and they asked me to become chairman of the board of a steel company, William Pittsburgh Steel. And I was the one who put that into bankruptcy. When the steel market collapsed because of international trade rules, these are important because we, there's a book, if you haven't read it, you should read it, Backfire, written by Lauren Barrett. Lauren Barrett, Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, University System, resigned that post to write this book. It was, why do we Americans get stuck in all these things, like of Vietnam, or today, contemporaneously, like in Afghanistan? Why does it we go there? The first 90 pages of a 400-page book tell you. The rest is anecdotal evidence, so you can't say it's wrong. The first one, we Americans think we're chosen. Wherever we go, we're chosen. We go to France, we say, they don't even speak English. We're chosen, they should speak what we speak. When Winthrop got that vote, he believed it. Have you ever heard God's on their side? No, God's always on our side. <laughs> right, when we think about it. Have you ever heard him say, God's for them? No. Out of nowhere, he or she picked us. Second, we have a unique place. We don't have institutions to which we're loyal, like kings and queens and parliaments and all. We have values to which we're loyal. And that distinguishes us. Why? 
We do not do things out of self-interest. We do things out of loyalty to our values. Wow, we're chosen. We're special. We believe in free trade. They believe in self-interest, restrictive trade. We don't care. They'll learn. Why? The third character. We look at the world with solipsistic lens. Solipsism means they are like us. They don't know it, but if you raise their country out of the ashes will rise a phoenix in our image. They want to be citizens in a democracy. Doesn't matter how developing it is, still she be one man, one vote. They believe in every, you know, separation of church and state. We believe in that. And I can tell you, Iran is what it is today because we interfered in an election in Iran and put a guy named Jamshid Abuzagar in as prime minister over the guy who should have been in there. And Jamshid Abuzagar told me through his staff, separation of church and state, stop paying the mullahs. And the mullahs were really ticked. <laughs> And nobody can avoid taxes. One thing's certain, that means taxes. Where would you hear that? Here. You start taxing the Mozaris, say, like, ooh, that's 2,000 years they've been there and never paid a tax to anybody. And lo and behold, the two groups that hated each other got together and in came this simple old preacher on the outside of Paris. And then, what's a preacher how it's better than could it be? And we got home. Those were our values. And remember that when you look at things, Abroad, because if you're an entrepreneur, that's where you're going to go. It's a lot of what you're going to do. Remember who we are and try not to be that. They want to be like us. They do not want to be us. Therefore, it's up to you to be like them so that they can feel comfortable wanting to be like me. Learn a foreign language. If you don't speak it, try. No one has to be fluent. You just got to try, and you got to at least know how to say hello and thank you. Instead of walking in and saying, good afternoon, sir, how are you? That person might have graduated from Oxford. They're going to speak to you in French, German, Swahili, something, just to let you know you're in their country. So remember those three characteristics that some people will lead you from, uh, into a place where you avoid something. What do I do now? <laughs> now, I'm an entrepreneur. What's an entrepreneur? And we got a definition one. Entrepreneur. You know what an entrepreneur is, Matt? I know what I think he is. That's okay. Probably not what you think he is. But I'm right because I'm standing here. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm just curious. Someone who takes an idea, idea and sells it to other people and uh, makes a lot of money. Very sophisticated. Really good. Anybody else got an idea? Somebody who takes limited resources and adds the most value to the world. That's another good one. That's very sophisticated. I know the definite because my wife asked me what the hell are we doing. <laughs> so I'll tell you what the other. Somebody who wants to work for themselves. But now you're getting to a point. Go on. There was an article that was uh, published as a result of Harvard's extensive deal. And I can't remember it exactly, but an entrepreneur is a person who will blindly continue to, to charge after opportunities when no resources are available to do to do, We're getting closer. I'll tell you what it is. Someone who is insanely optimistic. Now we're getting closer. See, really, see, this is sophisticated. Now we're getting closer. Everybody else got another one? And then I'll tell you exactly what it is. An entrepreneur goes to bed at night knowing he or she bet the whole damn farm. <laughs> Wakes up before he or she should to see if by chance they still have it. <laughs> and if they don't, Hell, I made that one, I'll go make another one. And the reason that's important is there's no security in being an entrepreneur. In the sense that you have an income to spend. You can be rolling like the Queen of England in her carriage. And the next day, it's gone. And they start calling, you haven't paid the $120 you made. I was rich, 120 no, I haven't. You need to learn to yell at the computer voices and hang up. And then they'll call again, ask you for the 120 plus $200 interest fee, and it grows to 10000 And pretty soon it's not damn, I'll negotiate my way out of it. Pray to God I get a check from someone. Okay? So, what am I? I'm an entrepreneur. What do I do? 
There's an organization, if you're not members of it, you must join. I don't get any money for it, so don't get this wrong. It's called Veterans Advantage. And if you have a husband or a wife and kids, put them on it too. If you have a mother and a father and an uncle, put them on it too. It's the only benefit you get that no one can take away. What was started by Lynn and Scott Higgins, they were at, she was at Son, uh, Solomon Brothers, he was always at Lehman Brothers, they made a lot of money, they retired before Lehman Brothers was Asa Visa, and they decided to dedicate themselves to build this benefit package for veterans. Among the things my kids told me, because I, they were, I may join, were that college kids could rent cars. You don't have to be 25. College kids could get 50% off on the train ticket. College kids could get 50% off on the bus. Why do I say college kids? They knew I wasn't taking buses, and I sure as hell wasn't going to go you know, ride around on a train for a discount if I could get somewhere faster driving. And then they started some of the other benefits again. They said, by the way, Dad, you're on the board. And I pulled the catalog out and I read it. Immediately told all of my kids, you put your, our grandkids on, everybody. Everybody must be on. Why? There's a $50,000 medical evacuation policy built in the base fee. $50,000. There's also a prescription drug policy. Entrepreneurs, you're talking about benefits here. There's a small D&D, 5000 And there are all these other things. But think of the one I just said. $50,000, it's free because it's just the cost of the membership comes. And by the way, membership can be from 30 bucks to 50 bucks about a year. Not a month. It means if you're 100 miles from home, you have a medical evacuation policy. And as an entrepreneur, you're going to be 100 miles from home a lot of times. Probably in a not too good car that you stretch the mileage on the tires until you hit the big one and you get the Jaguar. You have an accident. They say, where do you want to go? Mayo Clinic. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> they got to take it. Or uh, Scott Hager, who informed him, didn't even know he had a policy. His son got hit by a car in the Bahamas. They took him to the hospital. They said, this is Sunday. Don't worry, the doctor will be here Thursday. <laughs> Scott said, well, who calls his office? What's the cost of the medical evacuation out of here? Can you charter your plan? And the secretary said, you have a policy. He said, to do what? He said, to pick your son and family up and take him to a hospital. I went to Atlanta. Atlanta said, they're not good enough. They sent him to Emory. Emory said, go to Duke. All covered. All covered. That alone is a reason to be a member of that organization. That's why everybody I know said, join the damn thing, please. You get some <laughs> discounts. When you're an entrepreneur, it's short. Short of money. This is a way of extending that money. I'm working with them now, my first business I'm working on, to try to make the membership three million. Why? So that we want finally a veterans organization can call the White House and say, excuse me, the president will be appearing before our gathering at Thursday morning at 7 o'clock after breakfast. And the president's staff will call up and say, where is it? As opposed to what they say now, no thank you. We want a photo op with you. We don't want to talk to you. And I've worked for a lot of Republicans and Democrats, and that's what they're really interested in. There is a lack of soul committed to what we once were and have now become. So that's my ambition. That's why I'm working. So that's a simple one. It's a pro bono kind of thing, right? I'm still a real estate developer, but I'm in Bermuda. I own or have contracts on a piece of property uh, in Paget, which is the south side, which is the only protected beach. And we got permission to build because my wife's family started the NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council, and built on an environmentalist. Even if I didn't believe in it, but I do, but I would still be one because of my life. Um, and I brought the concept of lead development to Bermuda. And they said, well, what's that got to do with us? We save water. I say, yeah, we save water and all this. But you limit the footprint of your development. So I won't do it for four-story walkers. I want a 10-story building. And everybody, my architects and everybody said, that is the biggest joke in history. We haven't been over six stories. For Bermudians, let alone alien, that's what they call us. And 90 days later, I had permission to build a master. So that's what we're doing. And just this January, we have to 
by the hotel as well that we were building on. So we're going to be in the hotel business with luxury villas on the beach in Bermuda. Not, not a bad sounding fit. It takes forever. Started in 2004. And that's how long an entrepreneur may leave his money on the table, right? <clears throat> Working on another company, we're, uh, we took a shell of a penny stock company called Gel Stack that has two functional things, one for uh, uh, migraine and one for sleep. And then functional beverages are beverages, fruit juices that when you drink them, repair your joints, help with pains, put you to sleep, that's functional beverage. Joint juice, Joe Montana does. Uh, women's menopause is what uh, uh, Marie Osmond does. These are all functional beverages, and so we decided to roll them up because we have distribution in Russia, Poland, and Indonesia to go with it. So that's the business we're doing. We're trying to acquire, and what's the challenge? Due diligence. They have a great beverage, and you find out they stole the, the stole the mixture from someone, or they have no viability that it was done. They don't care because if they get sued, they don't have any money, they have nothing to lose, so they're putting the beverages out. Those are the kinds of dangers and pitfalls you have. But there are some that are legit. And if you can roll them up, there's a fortune to be made. And the last one I'm doing is I'm working with an entrepreneur that you may have heard of. The people my age, when no one's here. I'm in the 70s, and so no one that old, but people a little older than mine. Um, we all know the super, right? Everybody knows the super. A man named Malcolm Bricklin came up with the idea that why don't I go buy a Japanese car and put together a distribution network that sells the cars. But do it the way dealers want, meaning no one can horn in on your property. If you take pieces of the planet, and that's the dealer's sole right to sell that product, no one can do anything else. So in order to do that, you gotta find a little known product, because otherwise they're too powerful, the companies. And you gotta get entrepreneurs to be the dealers who say, hey, I've got my little section of the earth that no one can mess with. And you start selling them in this vehicle. It's got to have a unique thing. And had this four-wheel thing, which in the one of the super is kind of known at four-wheel drives, other than Jeep. And each dealer became so powerful that eventually they controlled the company. Because they had the demand. And demand is what controls production. And if you control demand, you control production, which means you don't have to buy the company no more. And then the Japanese realized that and said, this isn't good. So let's start buying back the dealers. And the Japanese government said, this isn't good. We'll give the money to buy back the dealers. The American entrepreneur said, that's going to be one expensive dealership. <laughs> and they made a fortune. And now they are the dealers that you read about. Stolupi with his ocean fast yachts. Cerulli up in northern New Jersey, largest Honda dealer in the world, but he's got Jaguar, uh, Bentley, he's got everything else. They're all loyal to Malcolm Griffin. Malcolm Griffin says to me, we're going to do electric vehicles. Are there any? And he starts sending me emails. There are more electric vehicles in this country than there are gas driven vehicles, except they're all one offs. They are the Subaru before they had distribution. So what he is doing, and I said I'll do it with him, we're going to duplicate the Subaru experience with an electric vehicle, starting out with scooters, and before Smart Car announced Mercedes, they were going to do it, we were doing it. So we were ahead of that. And we're going to license technology and develop by American entrepreneurs for three-wheeled, not four, three-wheeled electric vehicles Assembling it in a plant in East Hartford where every employee must be a veteran. That's, we don't care if you can walk, if you're in a wheelchair, we don't care. There's a job for you. And we're going to train veterans from all over the country. We've got converted condoms containers. They're going to be shipped to a dealer network. They're going to appear on the lot one day with all the electric vehicles and the supporting thing. People trained to sit inside the sales rooms who are veterans with their own power and everything else, with the most powerful well financed dealers who have to pay cash for their inventory that will give the dealer something when a person walks in the 
the yard and says, $40,000 for a Honda? I have a scoop. <laughs> I have a three-wheel electric vehicle with a steering wheel. Side by side seat. Goes for around $12,000. The average ride is five miles, one person. Five miles, one person. You hop in this sucker. You might be a hardy person at heart, but you can't stand up on a two-wheel hike. And here's a nice, quiet vehicle. It takes less parking than an Escalade. So everybody loves the fact that you're there. And we can change the color, the interior, every month. It's all out of fiberglass. And as he told me, the only one vehicle in the United States that can hit a wall at 125 miles an hour, and the driver thinks they have a good chance of living. build the frame and they wear an H harness. You're not allowed to put an H harness in a car. And probably the guy that makes the weird one has a monopoly and there's probably a government break that he got passed to keep them from true. Because now we said we're not only gonna build an efficient electric vehicle, no gasoline alternative. And because it's not heavy, the batteries take it twice as far. Another interesting idea. No inertia to and that five mile trip with one person in it will have plenty of space to store the groceries and everything else. And it's free. Free. That's my other venture. It was really exciting. I went to the state of Connecticut and they said, What do you need? Malcolm said $25 million. And they said, Okay, we'll consider it. Kind of interesting. Will you move in here? We'll pay it as you hire people. He says, We'll be up to 593 veterans. He thinks he'll be there in three years, but that's the way he thinks. And they will give him the money pro rata to the veterans he has. Much to our surprise, if you hire a veteran in East Hartford, they give you $900 a month subsidy. If you have 500 veterans, Malcolm says, I'm giving that to the veterans as bonus. First, we'll reserve it as collateral for the bank. But as soon as we satisfy that, he gives it to the veteran employees as their first participation. All of the boxes out there, the veteran must have an ownership interest. Working with the dealer who's going to be responsible for teaching him how to be an accomplished entrepreneur in an automotive or vehicular business. And then the most important, he said, well, where the hell are you getting this technology? Stanford University just had a consortium where they brought three-wheeled electric vehicles in, 50 of them. One guy says, you don't need three wheels. That's smart. No, it's gyro driven. Once you start it, you can't knock it over. It just sits there. You push it, it comes back up. You can find it. You can go on three wheel vehicles, gyro, look it up, you'll see it. It's on the internet. That guy sent all this stuff. It's an outcome to consider. So, what we were talking about here, someone said, it's a great idea. Someone has the guts to stay with it. No matter what it is, is optimistic. Here's a world-renowned entrepreneur who is the most optimistic guy in the face of the earth. He finds the technology and knows the key to success is selling. Not inventing, selling. And he has the experience to do it. Contrast, I didn't talk to him about that. He thought of it himself. So he has that other thing that you all have, a leg up on employees and all the subsidies that come with us, more importantly with you. So those are the entrepreneurial activities I do. In the meantime, I just run around hoping the hell the bar doesn't get sold. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? You want to be an entrepreneur? What, what do you want to be as an entrepreneur? Me. No? Me? You look like a guy that worked for me in Vietnam, like you should be a half bad. <laughs> 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 I want to make a difference. I want to address what I see as a problem and make a and disrupt the, the photo printing industry. The photo printing? Yeah, the photo printing industry. And just bring a unique set of unique background to it. Do you have the background already? How'd you get it? Just jumped right in. Just, just you taught yourself? Up. Yeah, that's it. Jumped in, got a couple of my buddies. 
in the military does and the company. What's stopping you from going to heaven? Uh, nothing more for it. You got the money? Um, kind of. I mean, you know, just friends and family. You know, we're dragging, pulling it on. Um, just a word of advice on that. When friends and family become your partners, you have something beyond a business relationship, which makes life very difficult. Because yeah. hmm. no one can guarantee success. I borrowed some money from a relative of mine. The number of times I paid it back and said, thank you, if I get more success where he doesn't have any money, I don't own it, I keep giving you money. <laughs> he says, just keep it up. I'll lend you $5,000 next time you need it. He's gotten 50 or 60 because I just feel guilty. And, and that's the only uh, kind of a word of advice. Don't be, don't be afraid to take your ideas to a place like a Mormon stamp. And you can, through the veterans community, you can get access to that. Morgan Stanley has a Medal of Honor gathering for all their high net investors every six weeks somewhere in America. So they use veterans to help them. There's no reason we're when you can't go in and see them. Same thing with all the banks. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase now has a veterans organization within it run by a guy named uh, Tom Higgins, who's a CIA as well as Navy veteran. And they have a thing, a commitment to veterans. American Bank of America is doing the same thing. Citibank's doing the same thing. Local banks, Bank USA is doing it. So don't hesitate before you do it to go see them with your idea and talk to them about what you really want to do and let them tell you what you need. You might be surprised. And then hit that internet and look what the government, state governments do. You might find, like we found in Connecticut, bang, $25 million. The only difference was we weren't inventing anything. Go to these banks, let them teach you. No need to remake it and try to surprise them. Because as a veteran, remember that call? No, I didn't go to college, I've been serving you. I'll go in my meantime. It's the same call you made. I got an idea, I'm sort of rocking in Afghanistan. I'd like some help. Don't want any money right now, I just want to tell you what I'm doing, I want some advice. The most valuable gift It's not money. Money, you get a lot of it, you lose it, you get it back. It's not junk we all accumulate, from jewels to clothes, the stuff Willie Nelson when they were taking everything you own, know, sitting in that beat the hell little aluminum lawn chair with his guitar. And the television reporter sticks a microphone, what's it feel to lose everything you have? And he said, what? I just stopped. What I have is my guitar and my health. And because I have a guitar, because I have my health, I'll get more stuff. And someone will take that too. So it doesn't feel bad at all. You think about it. Stuff isn't important. The most important gift we have is that which is finite. And unfortunately, in all our cases, it's more finite than we would like to believe. That's our time. If you have time to see someone, and vice versa, they have time to talk to you. That's a greater gift than if they said, here's a check, good luck. Senior Vice President of Chase Bank. Where'd that come from? He said, well, you know, I was Special Forces. Then I went Special Ops, nine years. I said, no, where, where'd the Senior Vice President? He said, well, hell, I shouldn't be a trainee. I said, no, but the guy's willing to sit down and talk to you and give you some advice and help. No, I want to be a Senior Vice President. He didn't get anything. He didn't get help, and he gets a job as a Senior Vice President. But he wasn't entitled. But for the advice, which is worth more, you're entitled, so don't hesitate to do that, okay? Any, anybody else? Let's see. And who else has got an entrepreneurial idea going here? Yes? Um, is there any source whatsoever that you can get a lead on? I mean, obviously you know where to hire vets, but this extra um, entitlement, you know, such as GI Bill, et cetera, is there anything on the hiring sector or private sector that comes with those benefits like Medicaid? Is there a source to find? Yeah, every, um, almost every bank today has set aside uh, <coughs> funds to invest in veteran-owned entrepreneurial businesses. Almost every one. Goldman Sachs has $600 million set aside for them. Now, the problem is they only have one condition. 
you got to be sponsored by a senior partner. And if no senior partners sponsor anything, they get credit for 600 million bucks and keep it on. And I'm sufficiently cynical to think that that's part of the announcement. But they do have it. And you can call them and they say who they are. And that's one thing you set out. Wherever you want to go to a bank, find out someone you might know. If they don't have a veteran shop, Goldman Sachs, you need to know a partner. And you can do that by just asking around. You'd be surprised at your network. Someone says, damn, yeah, my dad knows someone. Or my mother knows someone. Or my mother is a senior partner. Hot damn, you found it. <laughs> they take your idea and they sponsor it. So it, it's, it's what I do today. I work the network. I look to see who I know, what they do, where it can go. A Vietnam veteran guy named Bruce Leff is the managing director of all the Loeb family businesses. All of them that are owned by the Loeb family today. A lot of them are high-tech entrepreneurial efforts. One is, I think it's called Windstar. And what it is, is I didn't know this, but our weather reports come from them releasing 60 weather balloons in the same spot twice a day. That's the official weather collections for the United States. And I said, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> because there's a distance between the balloons. So what they did is put weather detection devices on the tail end of every airplane. They, they, you don't pay for it, they just basically say, can we attach it? So the thousands of landings and takeoffs give them instantaneous, multi-million readings per day, all over the world. And then they found out who the contractor is, United States Air Force, would like that information. Now the United States Army wants it. Then the French Army. Pretty soon all the defense people are buying it. But the people that tells us when it's going to rain or snow, nah. they're looking at a computer image plus these balloons. But there's an example of one. Then I'm that, I didn't even know what he did. I've known him a long time. And I said, what do you do? He said, wow, you know, I run all these businesses. And when he told me who it was for, I said, damn, that's pretty interesting. He said, can you help me? He says to me, that's what he needs. He says, I got to get into L3 communications. Well, Dick Cody, the former vice chief of staff of the Army, is a big deal in L3, is one of my students from West Point. I was teaching them. So I called him up and said, Yo, Prof wants a favor. I want you to look at this business, the electronic weather. That's how you get in, right? You network, look, show up at places, meet people, ask them who they are, get cars. I'll give another example. You can get invited to big events. Sal Dinner, you all know who he was, right? Medal of Honor guy from Iraq. He became quite a personality. He was a very wonderful guy and charming. A guy named Jimmy Lee, who's the vice chairman of the board of J.P. Morgan Chase, said, I asked Ken Langone, I asked Ross Perot, they couldn't do this. Can you get me somebody to appear at our chief executive summit, a mini dollars? talking about me. <laughs> Good deal this with me. He said, I want Sal Ginton. So I called Sal and I said, you got to go. And all you do there is collect cards from everybody that says, if you ever need anything, call me. <laughs> Damn, I don't need anything right now, but I'll remember that, sir. But take the cards. You will have a role in that. Anybody will hire you to get access to it. And I, I said, but you use the Rolodex to help your men and the women you serve with. Not yourself. Help them first. Then those people will give you the Rolodex again. It shows that you're not just for me. But that's another thing to do. Look at these gatherings. West Point the Foundation, the United States Army Foundation, National Association of Military Service. They have these gatherings all over the country. They invite business people. Why? They ask them to buy the tables. And without fail, there are five, six, seven of them set aside for you all. Six tables, Marine Corps birthdays. You don't have to have the money to go. They'll find you a seat. Go around, introduce yourself, and ask everybody for a card. You might be, oh, damn, look, chairman of the board. In the photo industry, right? You say, got my man. And you go, sit, sure, I'd like that. Come see. How is he going to say no? What man that had time to come visit you? How is she going to say no? Not a front end, but that's what you do. And you got to work that angle everywhere you go. For example, I show you never know where they come from. I do a lot of speaking, so 
I was asked to speak when I was chairman of the steel company to the rotary company of Seoul, Korea. And I thought, I don't want to go to a rotary. I never, I've been in American rotaries. Oh my God. It's always not the dentist, but the dentist cough buyer or something. It's never anybody, right? It's not the guy that owns the farm, it's the guy that cleans the tractor. <laughs> that's what I found. At least that's my image. They're at the Shiloh Hotel, which is the fanciest hotel in Seoul, in this little pagoda in the back. I walk in, and everybody's in black suit, not gray, black suit, white shirt, black tie, cufflinks, spit shine shoes, with one or two guys, guys only. It's a patriarchal society. I'm standing right just behind me. And I walked in, and I asked my career, I said, Who are these people? He said, They're going to introduce themselves. He was the chairman and CEO of the top 20 firms. I don't have enough business cards. <laughs> I got contacts that helped me in the steel business. I never dreamed that way. From showing up at a rotary and making some remarks. And because of what you all are, you are what people want to hear from. They want to know about your experience and your transition from uniform to civilian clothes. Go there. Get the rolling text. Build your role. That's where you're going to find your money, your partner. Surprised how many of them say, hey, for that, I got money. Of course, if you want to, I heard someone talking about converting buildings, there's no money for that. They want to buy the buildings cheap that you tried, that you bought, tried to fix up, and now they bolt your fly and take it away, and they say, good luck to you. That's what people in the real estate business are doing today. And so help me God is a new bubble. Because they buy it cheap, and they say, well, we bought it at 20% of value. Value when? When it was first built. What says to you that the damn thing's worth 20%? And you got to add financing, construction, finishing, you get it up to 50%. Then you got to have a profit. No, get 60%. What makes you think that that which is available on the market for 30% can be sold for 60? You know what makes you think? These are the flippers. They flip anything. They don't build anything. They don't make anything. They don't grow anything. So there ain't anybody taking the sincere idea of building a house today and giving them money. That's very, very different. They're looking at these ideas, though. Ideas that are different because there's a lot of money, other people's money, for that kind of stuff. Okay? Anybody else got a uh, thing you're looking for? Yes? Um, my car's in the agriculture uh, industry. Basically, uh, uh, it's for fruit uh, growers to basically uh, replace chemical pesticides with a heat treatment. Environmentally sound stuff, right? And also increases yield by about 10%. Did uh, you go to NRDC with that? No. Natural Resources Defense Council. They're the ones that developed the concept of lead for developers like me. They're the ones that stopped the Amchik Automo, uh, the atomic blast, because they didn't want to pollute the water. They're the ones that found the snail darter. They're the ones that said, stop dropping Con Ed hot water down the Storm King Mountain into the Hudson River, because you're going to ruin the striped bass. Those are the people you go to for that. And through them, they put you in touch with people that they would like you to invest in what you want to do. But more important, they also tell you whether you got the only idea. You might say, sorry, it's being done in India. And then you say, oh, damn, <laughs> I got to go back. But that's where you go. You go to the experts in the world for those kinds. Of, anybody in the agricultural that has environmental stuff, go to NRDC and people like that and tell them what you're trying to do and ask them what they think about it. You know why? They're hoping you come up with something that saves something. That's what they're there for. They're not there to make a business out of it. They started out, Smokey and Stephen Dunn, he was the head of Simpson Thatcher, happened to be my wife's grandparents, that's why I know. They're sitting there, she was one of the largest landowners in New England. Abbott family, all over New England. Have you been to Nantucket? Okay, Nantucket, you go through the channel entrance, there's that shore that goes all the way out to the lighthouse. She owned it, she didn't know it. She gave it to the birds. And her husband called me and said, what would you think if someone gave five miles of Nantucket to the birds? I said, Oceanfront? Yeah. Said, what would you think, what would you call them? I said, well, generous. He said, I'm thinking more like stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, stupidly generous, right? <laughs> but that's who she was. And they, they owned Storm King Mountain. They gave it to Harvard, it's called Black Rock Forest. They're sitting there, he's a head of Simpson Thatcher. She's an environmentalist. 
brilliant Con Ed is drilling under their home in the Sly to use the reservoirs in the forest that they gave to Harvard to do a gravity-fed power driving system. And she's sitting there going, boom, boom. They're drilling only at night. NRDC stopped them too. That's where the snail are. Okay? So those are the people you go to for that, for these environmental things. And there is federal money for that. Tremendous amount of federal money for environmentally sound things. Okay? Anybody else doing agriculture like growing food? Any, I know someone here is in the games business. I can tell you a little bit about the dot-com business. I'm going to share an observation that I got from you. My son was a Stanford undergraduate, a rugby player, and then went to Duke Law and intellectual, national, international intellectual property. He came back and worked, worked for Wilson Sonsini, where all the Stanford guys with the ideas were taking their eyes to the public, and they wanted to talk to him because he too wore shorts instead of dressing up in a fancy suit. Uh, he took a guy named Eric Greenberg and owned a company, I think it was called Veritas, and then he bought a company called Scion Corporation and started S C I O N. Not the little car, the Sign Corporation hired the head of Arthur Anderson and paid him $250 million a year. Owned by a 33 year old guy. I was there, the chairman of the steel company. I called up, I heard all this dot com stuff. I called my son, I said, Can you set some meetings for us to go out and meet the dot coms? I want to know what it means. I have no idea what this is. He set it up for me to be briefed by them. We walk in a the room, there's 21 people at the table, and my nine guys at one end. Everybody else is under the age of 25. And the guy starts out, Mr. Buke, I just want to let you know the only reason you have this many people, you have to know somebody. I said, you my son? He said, yes, sir. He's a general counsel, outside counsel. He asked us to do this. There's nothing you ought to know. Everybody in this end of the table is worth at least $2 million net worth, and I know that's not true of your end. First thing I think, what a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you want to know what it is, here's our business. And he started saying, we're looking for people that have plays. They worked on their play to this. We got to roll out. We can do this. We can do a divide and split and come back. And we don't really care. And I listened to this guy talk for about 20 minutes. And he said, you got any questions? I said, what the hell did you say? <laughs> He's with me. And I said, I didn't understand a word you said. He said, I'm so sorry, sir. But everybody else knew what he was doing. None of my guys did. He gave me some advice. So those of you who want to go in the technology business, or the services business, which is, everybody said, a service economy is what we are, right? You've all heard it. That came about under the Clinton years. The United States is a service economy. This guy said, sir, I'm going to make it as simple as it can for you. If you don't understand what I say, ask me, and I'll explain it. The only thing the internet did is provide the ability for disintermediation. He said, please write that down. What's this intermediation? Is that we put the end buyer consumer with the original maker grower provider. We disintermediate everything in between. He says, You notice what I said buyer, consumer, maker, grower. So I understand. He said, Financial services and all of the services will be provided in the future by the most highly educated, poorly paid societies on earth. And he said, and if you don't believe me, who answers the phone when you call Dell Computer? Who answers the phone when you call Citibank? Who answers the phone when you call Ford Motor Company, when you have a question about service? There is some godforsaken country with two PhDs getting $5 it's a fact, whether you like it or not, it's there. Why? It's cheaper, but the quality is good. Therefore, if you don't make or grow something in a highly paid, highly educated society, you have no role in the future of time. And we're the steel industry, you're seeing it all go to China. And we're saying, damn, how do we hang on to this thing? And we couldn't, because the laws weren't there for us. Reuben, Secretary of Treasury, traded access to the Chinese steel mills and manufacturing in the United States in exchange for access by American firms to the financial services of China. Treaty. He's quite proud of it. I was in Hong Kong, saw the press conference on TV. I said, God, that's not good for us, because I was looking for investors for the steel company. In the afternoon, 
the Chinese announced they'd given all the life insurance for all the people's public of China to Wuhan Insurance Company, now the largest insurance company in the world. They had been formed like a year before that. Didn't you think, wouldn't we roll it back and say you don't get the manufacturing? No, we didn't. And you think about it, wouldn't that to be logical? They are not an open, free society. They're going to decide who gets what in their society. We lost the coke industry, poking coke. We lost most of the tin plate. We lost most of the steel. We do scrap steel. Real steel we have. We've lost the making of almost anything. You might have seen the ad that was in, the, I think, USA Today yesterday. Guys saying, those damn Olympic guys are wearing something. And they're arrows and everything in this house made in China, made in China, made in China. So that, when I took that lesson from Science Corporation, and I went to four or five of their VC ventures, he talked to the venture capitalists that way. He said, you know, all these people, entrepreneurs, just like you, this was in San Antonio. No, Austin, probably Austin, one of the big Silicon Valley kind of players. He said, they're going to spend billions of dollars, and they're going to come back and get more money from it, and you'll give it to them, won't you? And they're all nodding their head. He said, so don't worry about what you get. Just spend it. They're going to give it to you. Until they decided not to spend it. And he gave the example of petfood.com, which was the idea of the internet. Pet food arrives at your house. Yeah, you do the internet, goes into the secretary's desk, takes a credit card down to the local A&P, buys a batch of the stuff, puts it in FedEx, <laughs> ships it to him. And for that, he gets Millions and millions and millions of dollars. But it didn't go the way you think it goes, which is the internet and all automated comes out. It was just a woman, thank you. Goes down the store, buys it, and that extra. <laughs> that allowed him to convert it to all of this, all of this incubator money that they were getting. Okay? I think we're running out of time, right? Yeah. Any questions? Any more for me? Only thing I'd, I'd just tell you, and this isn't closing. The hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is not being afraid. Because there are times when you think it's over. My son-in-law went from owning part of his dad's construction firm, where all the rich people in Manhattan used their interiors, to wanting to be the woman shoe designer. I said, you had an epiphany? No. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I'm going to do it. You don't know what it is. The women might know her, but you go. You go and look up Matt Bernson's shoes, B-E-R-N-S-O-N. You look at the price of the Love Sandal, which is a flip flop, for 150 bucks. He is the hottest young woman shoe designer in the world. But there were three years where he cried every night, not knowing how he would pay the bills the next day. The hardest thing is to not give in to the fear. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe you're right. And you have to have the courage to pursue what you know is right. And the even more courage to give up on something you realize is wrong. So you don't waste your time. Thank you for all you've done for this country. Thank you for coming back to an absolutely deplorable economy and keeping the faith. Thank you for coming here. Good luck to you. If I can ever do anything to help you, don't hesitate. Let me know. I'll put you in touch with people if I know. And the most important thing I would say is when you bet the farm, get at least three or four hours before you run it. Because without the four hours, you're not. God bless you all. Thank you.